This is a really nice way to end the term uh, with the guest speaker who needs no introduction to um, urbanists and scholars of race and ethnicity. I did have a, a brief moment of worry last week when I received Professor Finney's uh, email auto reply that said there was job action at her university. And I thought, oh no, we've been setting this up for a while and it looks like this might, uh, might not happen. Um, but uh, fortunately for us, she's still able to, to join us today. One of the benefits of the pandemic, if I can put it this way, is that it's opened up um, the ways that we think about engaging scholars who are uh, working farther afield. We'd obviously much prefer to host Professor Finney in person at the Urban Center, but this is still a, a professional delight under pandemic circumstances. Nissa Finney is Professor of Human Geography at the University of St. Andrews. Her work specializes in neighborhood change, residential mobility, and housing experiences with an overarching framework of social and spatial justice. Professor Finney is also recognized for her notable contributions and service to the Academy, such as her editorial work for the journals Population, Space and Place, as well as Urban Geography. She is a member of the ESRC Center for Population Change and a founding member of the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity. The title of Professor Finney's talk is The Slow Dispossession of Home for Migrants and Minorities in Britain and Implications for Local Governance. And with that, Professor Finney, we've been eagerly anticipating your lecture since we reached out a couple of months ago. We're so pleased to have you join us and a very warm welcome to you. Well, thank you, Michael, for your very kind introduction. And I'm really glad to be here talking with you this afternoon or this evening as it is here in frosty Scotland. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about the long-term experiences of migrants and minorities in Britain. And I'm going to make the argument that there is and has been a slow dispossession of home for migrants and ethnic minorities and that we can see this as a process of spatial injustice. I'll make the argument in two parts. First of all, by evidencing the disadvantage and the stark and persistent inequalities in housing experienced by minorities. And then secondly, by illustrating how this is underpinned by processes of racialization and exclusion. I'm going to be drawing on several projects and collaborations in this presentation, and I gratefully acknowledge the work, the very hard work of my colleagues in what I'm going to present. And these are colleagues from the ESLC Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, who you can see on the slide here. Also, thanks to the research participants and the Economic and Social Research Council who funded this research via the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity. Now, the empirical material that I'm going to present to you, and there will be quite a lot of that, is all from Britain. But I hope that the situation echoes that in many other places and that the argument that I'm making will have a broader resonance. And we are, of course, considering these matters in unprecedented times when questions of racial and ethnic inequalities have risen to the fore. We've seen much discussion about institutional racism, particularly in terms of the police in the Black Lives Matters campaigns over the last couple of years in particular. And in the UK, we've seen what's become known as the Windrush scandal, where in 2018, Commonwealth immigrants who had been living in the UK for decades were illegally deported because of administrative failures of the Home Office. We've also seen in the UK a decade of the tightening of border controls and deliberate creation of a hostile environment under the leadership of the then Conservative Prime Minister Theresa May. And this is a real picture of what actually has been taking place. Vans with this message going around the streets of the UK, encouraging illegal immigrants to declare themselves. 
And this was integral, this kind of hostile environment to Brexit debates and the final outcome of the UK leaving the European Union. And this narrative continues to be present just now, this week, even when we see rows between France and Britain about the admittance of asylum seekers who are crossing to England via the English Channel. We've seen the naming of racism in institutional contexts, particularly sport in the Football World Cup this summer and in the last week or so in Britain, um, a scandal about racism in English cricket. So racism at the heart of English culture is now being spoken about. And in the last two years, we've seen very stark questions raised about how vulnerability and risk to coronavirus is not even across ethnic and religious and migrant groups. And an intervention here um, by the opposition Labour Party in the form of this report, an, unav an avoidable crisis, explicitly named racism as one of the causes of the particularly detrimental effect of COVID-19 on ethnic minorities in Britain. Finally, by way of socio-political context, we have a new narrative for social and economic development from Boris Johnson's Conservative government. And that narrative is one of leveling up the country, a desire to address primarily economic inequalities and the disadvantages of areas, usually areas in the north of England that are seen to be peripheral or left behind. Um, and we await just now the, the leveling up white paper but meanwhile, this quote is taken from a speech given by the Prime Minister in July. And I want to point out five, five themes from this speech that really characterise the current drive in terms of local economic and social development. Firstly, Boris Johnson starts with this statement that geography can turn out to be destiny. So some of us might critique this for being ecologically determinist, but he's definitely um, in tune with those neighborhood effects, effects scholars who look to see the effects of living in a particular place. Secondly, um, leveling up is about leveling up opportunity, um, not necessarily outcome, a very important distinction. Thirdly, the focus is on a strong and dynamic wealth creating economy. So we can get equality by focusing on the economic. Fourthly, what would leveling up look like? He said we will be able to recognize it when we have raised living standards, spread opportunity, improved our public services and restored people's sense of pride in their community. So a mix here of economic and social um, ambitions for the levelling up programme. And finally, and importantly, I think for what I want to talk about, this levelling up agenda comes with a plan for strong and accountable local leadership. So this levelling up agenda is new in language, but not in ambition, and it follows a tradition of recent decades, um, common also, also in the Canadian and North American context of political attention on regional economic inequality and at a more local level neighbourhood regeneration and renewal. But what is new in this levelling up formulation in the UK is the context of multi-scalar governance. So first, the devolved nations of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have control over key social arenas, including housing, local government and to a certain extent communities. Second, there's a structure of directly elected mayors of local authorities for England. And the first one of these was probably the most famous, the mayor of London, first elected in 2000. But there are now 25 elected mayors across England, and there have been 10 elected since 2017. And 
Interestingly, these 10 that have been elected most recently all represent combined authorities, so groupings of local authorities, including the combined authorities of Liverpool and Greater Manchester. So just now, over 23 million people, that's around 45% of the English population, are represented by an ele directly elected local mayor. And also noteworthy, only three of these 25 elected mayors are, are of the Conservative Party who currently have control over the UK government at Westminster. So potential there for quite a lot of interesting dynamics and tensions at these different layers of government in our thinking about local development and housing and ethnicity. And it's in this context of renewed questioning of ethnic inequalities and racism, reincarnation of political attention to local inequalities and a new context for local government that I make this presentation this afternoon. I want to frame my argument today with concepts of home and of spatial justice. It's long been recognised that boundaries of home are both physical and symbolic. There are material, economic, cognitive and social dimensions of feeling at home. And there's some super work recently on domesticity, gender and home. And I'm thinking in particular of Alison Blunt and Cathy Borrell and Sarah Marie Hall, who reveal the very everyday experiences of home and homemaking. But what I want to focus in on today is the material aspects of home, of housing, home as a structure, as a dwelling, as a physical property, as a physical home. The physical place matters, as Somerville tells us, for ontological security and physical well-being. The long-standing idea of home in the UK was bolstered in the in the period after the Second World War when there was considerable investment in housing across the country, really urged on by a political commitment to the idea of a right to a home and this being central to human experience. But in recent decades the ideology has shifted very much to housing as an asset thus diminishing the idea of the right to a home and shifting emphasis from well-being to property. And I'm concerned with how this threat to a home and the undermining of the notions of a right to a home has been unevenly experienced across people and places. And East Hope's work is helpful here, pointing out that in countries where there is a normative preference for home ownership, which is indeed the case in the UK and in Australia, where she takes her case study, it's become increasingly difficult for those in the private rented sector to feel at home. And we'll see later the relevance of this focus on the private rented sector. So she writes, while the challenges facing renters in regard to their ability to feel at home in their rental properties are affected by the nature of the housing market, and in particular the undersupply of rental dwellings. They are further exacerbated by residential tenancies legislation and policy settings that prioritise the needs of owners to mobilise their assets over the needs of tenants for secure occupancy. And I want to couple this idea of home and the erosion of home with notions of social justice following Edward Sojer. And his writings were concerned with emphasizing the geographical in the production and reproduction of inequalities, how the spatial situatedness of social processes is entwined with their nature and their products. And part of Sojer's concerns in his work on LA was how processes of racism and racialization, and importantly for him, social movements and resistance are emplaced so I take what Soja calls and advocates for an assertive spatial perspective. And he speaks of spatial injustice being situated at different geographical resolutions. And in this paper, I'm concerned with the local scale where unjust geographies arise endogenously or internally from the distributional inequalities created through discriminatory decision-making by individuals, firms, and institutions. So a focus there 
on the processes of discrimination at a variety of scales. So I intend to make the argument first that the threat to home is patterned by race, and second that this happens through multi-scalar processes of racialization that represent spatial injustice at a local resolution. But before I provide my evidence for this argument, let me say a little bit about ethnicity in Britain. Here we have a representation of ethnic groups in England and Wales. Um, you will see this dates from 2011. Uh, you will see many of my slides which date from 2011 using the last census. Uh, this is because like in many places, data of a quantitative and geographically broad nature on ethnicity are very hard to come by without relying on the census. We eagerly await the outputs of the, the 2021 census. And I'm going to use the concept of ethnic group a lot in the first part of the evidence that I present. And the ethnic groups here include immigrants and their descendants. So place of birth is not distinguished in these categories. And although there's much debate to be had about ethnic group categorization, and I'm very happy to elaborate on that later, it's, it is useful because it identifies people in terms of their race and migrant background combined. So for England and Wales, we see here in the small circle that 80% of the population identifies as white British, and the large circle shows that the remaining 20% is a diverse mix with the largest groups representing colonial, refugee and European Union migrations over the last 50 years. There's a slightly different picture for Scotland. Um, the data here being separate, again, one of the issues of a devolved nation um, where they, we have separate statistical offices. And in Scotland, around 4% of the population is non-white. And of course, ethnic groups are not evenly resident across the country. Minorities, like in, in most um, Global North cities, tend to live in urban centres, reflecting their migration histories to places of employment and their kinship networks. The map shows the distribution of white British with the highest proportions of white British being in blue. And you can see that for most of the country, um, over 80% of the population is white British. And it's just in the, the urban conurbations that we see lower proportions of white British. And in some parts of the major conurbations, particularly London, Birmingham and Manchester, we see neighbourhoods and locales where less than 20% of the population is white British. A, a crucial piece of contextual information about ethnic groups in Britain is differing levels of poverty between them. And this might seem like quite a simple table taken from a, a recent large scale household longitudinal survey, but it's actually quite difficult to obtain and calculate this information in the UK. It tends that um, education or occupational differences are the focus, but when we do calculate poverty, you can see that the inequalities between ethnic groups are really quite stark. Um, so the table shows that for non-white minority groups, a fifth of households live below the poverty line with about a quarter for black Africans and four in 10 Pakistani households in the UK living below the poverty line, which I think is quite astounding. Four in 10 Pakistani households living below the poverty line. Let's move on to how this translates into experiences of housing. First, a story, a true story a story of this tower block, Grenfell Tower in London. In June 2017, Grenfell Tower set alight. 72 people died. You can see most were not white. Grenfell Tower is in the London borough of Kensington, a stone's throw from Notting Hill. In Notting Hill, the houses look like this. 
no fires killing 72 as a result of substandard construction have been reported here. The story of Grenfell Tower is an exemplar of ethnic inequalities in housing, how these happen at very local scales and how they can have very dire consequences. And to reinforce the, the spatial point, this chart shows the distribution of neighbourhoods that different ethnic groups live in, in terms of poverty or deprivation. So the horizontal bar in each of the box plots is the average level of neighbourhood deprivation for people in each ethnic group. So, for example, on average, the white British population lives in neighbourhoods with a deprivation score of 15, which is a low deprivation score. Although, of course, we, we should note that there are people in the white British group who live in areas of very high deprivation. But in comparison, in the centre of the chart, we see the average deprivation for Pakistani population in Britain, which is 40, which is a high deprivation score. So the types of neighbourhoods which on average different ethnic groups are living in vary remarkably in terms of their levels of poverty. And across these neighbourhoods, ethnic inequalities in housing are stark and they are persistent. This chart shows in each column the proportion of each ethnic group in home ownership in grey, in social renting in blue and in private renting in red. And I want to focus on the private renting, that's the red sections of this chart, which can be characterised in the UK as the most precarious and least desirable in general tenure. Two points here. In general, ethnic minorities have higher levels of private renting than the white British, and levels of private renting have increased more for ethnic minorities than for the white British since 2001. And this is indicated by the white figures overlain on the bars, which show the percentage change in the intercensal period. For many Black and Asian groups, private renting increased by around about 20% over the decade, whereas the increase for white British was less than 10%. So this not, not only suggests higher levels of private renting for minorities, but a widening of that gap between the majority and the minorities, a widening of the inequalities in terms of security of housing. And this is confirmed here with data from the English Housing Survey, um, we see by 2016, if you look at the bottom right hand side of this table, that over half of some ethnic groups were living in private rented housing compared to 16% of the white British population, for whom the, the proportions have been relatively stable um, in the five years since the 2011 census. I think minorities are also more likely to live in houses that are too small for their families, using official definitions of overcrowding that take into account the, the gender mix, the age mix um, of the household and the number of rooms and bedrooms in the house. For example, we can see in the grey segments the proportion of housing, households in overcrowding, um, showing that a third uh, of Bangladeshi, Pakistani and Black African households are overcrowded compared to 5% of white British. So one in three Bangladeshi, Pakistani and Black African households in Britain are living in household conditions that would be considered officially to be overcrowded. But these patterns of course vary across the country. For example, here we have overcrowding for the white other group, which is largely migrants from the European Union. And this is for districts of England and Wales for 2001 at the top and 2011 in the bottom map. It's not necessary to, to see the detail in these maps, but just to grasp the patterns and the changes, the darker the color, the higher the levels of overcrowding. So we see that over the decade for the white other ethnic group, levels of overcrowding both increased overall and spread from London and the Southeast, the, the dark brown area in the top map to 
the whole of England and Wales. Not only are ethnic minorities overrepresented in overcrowded housing, they're also less likely to have green space. Now, this chart comes from a new and very exciting survey, the Evidence for Equality National Survey, that I have been leading within code over the last year to document the experiences of ethnic and religious minorities over the course of the pandemic. And Evans is unique in its coverage of ethnic groups. You see the list here is more extensive than in previous charts that I've shown, and also in topics. Uh, we can't know anywhere else about the, the types of facilities people have in their houses and their gardens. And although these are very preliminary results, so please, please do not quote them and the data are as yet unweighted, they do seem to suggest that having a garden is most likely for white British and Pakistani groups and least likely for Chinese traveler and Arab groups with considerable variation across ethnicities. Now I want to conclude this demonstration of the housing disadvantage of ethnic minorities with an indicator of housing deprivation using census microdata, individual level data. The housing deprivation here is a composite indicator. So those experiencing housing deprivation are, for example, in overcrowded accommodation without central heating with shared kitchen or bathroom facilities. And with the white British group on the left hand side, we can see that levels of housing deprivation are greater for other ethnic groups. And what this chart also shows is the intersections with immigration. So the patterns are displayed by time of immigration. For each of the ethnic groups, the left-hand light gray bar in the set is housing deprivation for those who are born in the UK. And the right-hand dark bar for each ethnic group is immigrants who arrived recently in the late 2000s. So for all ethnic groups, recent migrants have the highest levels of housing deprivation. For example, if we take the Bangladeshi group who have the highest levels of housing deprivation, 42% of those born in the UK live in housing deprivation, rising to 53% over half of Bangladeshis who arrived recently since 2007 live in housing deprivation. And these patterns remain if we model housing deprivation taking account of age, occupational social class, tenure, household type and accommodation type. In other words, the differences we see here between ethnic and migrant groups are not due to the age and class differences between these ethnic and migrant groups. So these inequalities are stubborn, they're persisting over time and between migrant generations. So in some ethnic Minorities and migrants in Britain are severely disadvantaged in housing and in neighbourhood. And this disadvantage is persisting, indeed increasing in some respects, and in my view constitutes a threat to home for minorities. So if we're to address this, we need to understand how and why these inequalities are reproduced. And I want to focus on this idea of the dispossession of home, the processes through which home and right to home are eroded around four themes. Localised racializations, discrimination and exclusion in housing law and practice, the individualization of responsibility and fragmented chaotic systems. And the data that I'm going to use for this section of the presentation comes from qualitative fieldwork undertaken since 2013 and ongoing the, the, at this point in time. And the fieldwork's been undertaken in diverse neighbourhoods in four cities, Glasgow, Manchester, Cardiff and London, and the orange dot there is St Andrews, where I am currently sitting. So, First of all, local racializations, by which I mean that the way that race, ethnicity and diversity are perceived and narrated differs between the localities and the housing providers and residents in the localities. 
Indeed, whether race is explicitly present in discourses of housing and community is particular to each place. Nevertheless, our work found that explicit or not, ideas of race, of difference, of diversity were present in the discourses of housing and community building and shaped approaches to housing work. For example, there was a tendency in London and Manchester for housing sector workers to de-emphasize problems of racism by narrating their neighborhoods as, as super diverse and celebrating that diversity. In Glasgow and Cardiff, there was more uh, explicit focus on need to build an integrated communities to borrow a po policy catchphrase. But a recurrent theme across the localities in which we've been working is this undercurrent of the need to avoid ethnic tensions. As this local councillor in Manchester illustrates, We've got several areas where there are some quite high tensions, very high numbers of private rented accommodation with a high turnover, which means it's really difficult to build any kind of settled community. So a constant striving for settled community is underpinned in, in all of the places we've been working by this fear, which has been particularly evident since 2001 of ethnic tensions and ethnic conflict. The second theme of processes of dispossession of home that I want to draw out is discrimination and exclusion. <clears throat> In a review of housing citizenship and migration law and workshops with housing pra practitioners around the country, uh, colleagues and I concluded that within all sectors of housing, we draw the overarching conclusion that discriminatory processes towards migrants and minorities are systemic and slippery in that they can be difficult to precisely evidence and challenge, particularly as they have become embedded and normalized over a long period. Furthermore, tackling housing disadvantage and discrimination is hampered by the fragmented housing sector and anti-immigrant polity. And what we did as one aspect of this work was to chart the changes in um, housing, law since the 1940s as it pertained to migrants and minorities and also changes in immigration and citizenship law which had relevance for housing and i'm not going to pull out the specifics of this charting that that led to the conclusions that i just read but please, please do have a look if you're interested in seeing that timeline which we think points to an accumulation of tightening of borders within the country, particularly in terms of right to a home. And for ethnic minority groups, early evidence from the EVEN survey suggests that this accumulation of discriminatory policies and practices translates into recent experience of unfair treatment in housing. For one in 10 ethnic minorities, rising to around one in five for some ethnic groups. And given that this question asked about when seeking housing, and most people will not have been seeking housing in the last five years, this is a quite a worryingly high figure, particularly when co compared to the white British group at the bottom of the chart, where fewer than 2% of respondents had experienced unfair treatment. A third finding to highlight um, in the dispossession of home is the devolving of responsibility for community to individuals, for example, through a policy emphasis on behaviour change. As this housing association worker in Glasgow comments, it's looking to promote behaviour change, raising awareness around looking at the appearance of the neighbourhood and the environment, recycling, energy efficiency, fire safety, being neighbourly, and a range of activities, but with the, not a hidden message as such, but educational as well. So trying to make it fun and interactive and promote tenant engagement, but trying to look at changing behavior. 
And some residents were, were very skeptical about these initiatives of behavior change and encouraging mixing in communities, such as this resident in Glasgow, talking about one community event that they went to. I just sort of walked in and it was like there's 200 people here and 195 of them are white. How is this a local community gathering? And there was about three Asian people. And then the other two was this old Romanian Roma man and the last who'd come to translate for them. And that was it. And it was just, it was horrific. And another resident in London. So sharing a cupcake with somebody along a street party doesn't make you friends for life. Doesn't mean you still don't have racist views. So quite critical reflection um, from residents of the initiatives to try to create community among their housing estates. Fourth and final theme is of fragmented and chaotic housing systems and the difficulties of service provision and effective cross-sector working have been exacerbated by austerity policies for local government and voluntary community sector over recent years, as this regeneration officer in Manchester comments, we're having to work in a different way, which is about bringing in investment and residential growth and stuff like that. But I think we do do our very best to engage with and talk to people. So at the heart of what we try and do, there might be limitations on that in terms of the resources that we have to do that. I mean, go back a few years, I spent a lot of my time out and about in communities, talking to people, going to meetings, doing stuff quite actively. And a lot of my time now is sitting at a desk because we don't have the offices anymore. And similarly, this has left some housing sector workers skeptical. So this, this um, participant commented, we have a hub which brings the police and social workers and housing and all that together. They do some good work and they're pretty good, but it's been more about a typical political response and let's be seen to be doing something rather than addressing it. And the, the final quote that I'll show from an interview this month illustrates the growing pressures on the housing system and the challenges of multiscalar governance of housing. A local council in Manchester. As I fully anticipated, all these Afghan families are just stuck in hotels because the government's not prepared to fund a housing solution. And the solution isn't and can't be social housing because apart from anything else, a lot of them have got large families and we just don't have any big houses. We don't have homes that we can put people in. And so they're just stuck because I'm not prepared for us to offer temporary accommodation to people without some kind of commitment about their long-term housing. And as their long-term housing solution can't be us, it has to be the government, and they're just not interested, as far as I can make out, they're just not doing anything anymore. We're not just going to dump people in poor quality private sector housing, unless the government is prepared to look at private sector, look at alternative solutions. These people are just going to sit in these hotels. And I've seen some quite distressing stories about people saying they'd rather go back to Afghanistan. There's the great big drama of the airlift and how great the British army is. So we've rescued all these people, but we haven't got a proper offer for them. So to conclude, by way of a summary of my argument, I hope that I've built a demonstration using quantitative and qualitative data from seven years of work with the code that minorities and migrants are clearly disadvantaged in housing and persistently so, and this constitutes a threat to home in a material sense, and thus a threat to ontological and security and physical well-being. I've tried to illustrate some of the ways in which these disadvantages are reproduced through local variation in the way that race is present or not in housing discourses, the cumulative exclusions and boundary making in national housing and immigration policy and law and local implementations, the emphasis on behaviour change initiatives and the fragmentation of the housing system. I suggest that this combination of disadvantaged and racialized policy enactment constitutes spatial injustice at a local resolution. So what might this mean for local governance? 
Well, if, if we accept the argument that dispossession of home and spatial injustice are real and problematic, then the new levelling up agenda needs to focus on housing and ethnicity in ideology and resource far more explicitly than has been evident so far, which is not very evident at all. And this may mean drawing attention to particular populations and particular places with particular housing needs, which has not been the way that housing policies have operated, making explicit the needs of particular communities. Because the challenge here are the embedded discourses of racialized competition. So new ways of framing this attention would be needed so that this shifts from being an issue of ethnic comp competition and tensions and ethnic difference to an issue that at the heart of it is about the right to a home. And for this, I think that new ways of, of seeing will, will be required that take, if you like, the view from, from the margins that decolonize housing provision for example, by not shying away from the need for larger accommodation to reduce overcrowding for some minority groups who have more children than average or who choose to live in intergenerational households. Or this might mean being more accepting of the desire for residential clustering rather than stereotyping and stigmatizing so-called segregated communities. And it's clear from our work that the housing sector and local government workers are invested in their communities and incredibly committed to them, but are tremendously constrained by regional and national political and economic contexts. But I think to end on a, a slightly positive note that just now, the renewed national focus on race, racism and local inequalities and the call for localities to lead their own development does represent an, an opportunity to pivot housing priorities and perhaps even to initiate a repossession of home for Britain's minority communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Finney, for that talk. I am so delighted that you decided to end on a positive note. There was much to digest in there and many points of contact uh, between your experience and ours. Obviously, very different contexts, but in some respects also, I suppose, sadly, in some ways, uh, some shared experiences as well. Um, so what I'll do now is uh, open it up to the entire group for a question and answer period. And uh, if you could just raise your hand and uh, we'll see you and call on you. Elmond. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I just wanted to find out, like, have you done any follow-up studies to unpack the impact of COVID-19 on these inequalities? And uh, whether was there likely to be a difference in your findings in terms of how COVID has sort of maybe uh, amplified some of these vulnerabilities? Yeah, thank you, Alman, for, for that question. So yes, we are following up on that. And Hannah, who you can see here in the audience, is, is right now undertaking some of the qualitative field work, field work um, with housing workers and residents in an, in an area of, of Manchester, specifically asking exactly the question that you're interested in. And I think that something that is coming through quite strongly is um, the, the levels of isolation of minority communities during this time, um, the specific needs of kinship networks that are not necessarily attended to, and the particular regulations that were put in place around housing, such as non-eviction during the, the lockdowns, um, which 
in, in theory sound wonderful and gave people uh, temporary security in their housing, but actually led to quite a backlog and shortage of housing supply for other people who, who needed it. And um, so there's less moving around, less moving house, less availability of, of housing. In terms of the, the broader effects of the, the pandemic, the, the even survey that I mentioned was set up exactly exactly to do that. So this is this is the, the largest survey of ethnic minorities in Britain. We have 14,000 participants in there. And we, it, we took quite an innovative approach to that sampling. It's a non-probability survey. So we're currently working quite hard on the non-probability adjustments and waiting for the, for the survey. And then we will be able to say quite a lot about how the pandemic has affected different groups comparatively and, and in different parts of the country. And for example, how different contexts of housing and household and family in different geographical locations may or may not be related to things such as vaccine hesitancy, trust in politicians, experiences of racism. So um, to be continued, I think is, is the answer to your, your question really. But one, one thing in summary is that it seems um, the, the inequalities and the negative experiences of ethnic minorities, if anything, in housing and more generally, are, are quite exacerbated by this, this pandemic. Um, the only positive, as I've just been hinting at, is that this issue is now much more in public debate. So people, compared to two years ago, you tried to talk about ethnic inequalities, about racism in any political context, people did not want to listen. Now they do want to listen. And for me, that's a, that is strangely a, a positive outcome. Thank you. Zach. Uh, Zach, I think you're muted. Ah, sorry about that. Thank you for a, for a fascinating uh, presentation. I, I have a, uh, I would like to pick up the theme of governance. I, I think at the beginning, you uh, deliberately noted that the, the national government is, is conservative. And of course, uh, these devolved uh, local uh, authorities, these new directly elected mayors and so on are mostly not conservative. Um, Later on, you you sort of drew out a, a, a tension between um, you know the national government kind of dumping dumping housing and other responsibilities onto to local authorities and so on. So I'm wondering if you could just unpack a little bit whether you see devolution, whether it be to local authorities or to the uh, uh, devolved national governments. Um, as as an asset or as a problem, right? Uh, is is this Whitehall neglecting, abdicating its authority by dumping things downwards, um, or does devolution enable more flexibility and more more creativity and sensitivity to local local uh, demographic difference? Both, Zach, I think. So. Um... An example of where it is both a, a problem and a benefit is in the allocation of, of social housing. So take Greater Manchester, one of the biggest combined authorities, which has one of the most prominent elected mayors, Andy Burnham, who's a, a Labour Party mayor. So the Andy Burnham has, has to contend with having allocation of people from social housing who can't be accommodated in London being sent to Manchester for accommodation. So that's where the, there are particular problems of this multi-layered level of governance. On the other hand, he has the advantage that he has some, some powers over the regulations around provision of social housing. So for example, in many places, there's a, a requirement of having lived in a particular authority for a certain length of time, usually between two, two and five years before you have an entitlement to social housing, whereas there is not that rule in Greater Manchester because the, the regional government has decided that they want to make housing available more widely. So there's a pro and a con of having some of these powers devolved to, to local regional governments. In terms of the national context, oh, there's a tension in Scotland, for example, between 
the management of immigration and the management of housing. So go, Scottish government doesn't have control over immigration, but it does have control over housing. Um, so it, in some ways, the, 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 the problems that are experienced in housing, so for example, in, in the final quote there about housing Afghan refugees, the Scottish government can sort of say, well, this is, this is um, a problem, but it's not our problem because we don't have control of immigration. So I think both sides of those assets or burdens are used politically in this context of a, a very, a very dynamic and evolving situation of multi-layered elected governments, which I think in the UK we're only just really getting a feel for and getting a sense of, of these kinds of dynamics and powers and relationships. Sounds like Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Endless inter-jurisdictional back and forth. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Victoria, I see your hand up, but Hannah Haycox is with us and I know is a collaborator. Did you have a follow-on point? Uh, oh, no, I, I was just going to ask um, a quick question. What, Victoria, please, um, there's, there's no rush with mine at all. Thank you. Vicky. Okay, I, I actually have a bunch of questions, but I mean, this is so reminiscent of what goes on in Canada, but you know, one of the issues is that refugees come in, they come in with big families, they come in sometimes with disabilities, they need very specific housing. Um, so there's that on the one side and they, they get a, um, like a stipend for the year of uh, support, financial support from the government. But it's not really enough to support the housing that they need. Um, on the other hand, it's the amount of support that, for example, pensioners get, so, or people on, on welfare. So you kind of have this tension between their needs and then not wanting to have people develop negative attitudes towards them because it seems like they're getting more than others, right? So there's always this back and forth. They need housing and they need housing for larger families. They often come in with big families. And, you know, the housing market is crazy now. So a lot of them are still stuck in the hotels. I mean, for, for months, same as there. The Afghan families in London, Ontario are stuck in the hotels because there's nowhere to put them, basically. But if we give them too much, then you have those people kind of saying, you know, why are they getting more than everybody else? And, you know, we kind of have relatively favorable attitudes toward refugees in Canada and towards immigration. So there's always this tension about what do you give people? And then how does that influence attitudes? And I just wondered if you had thoughts about that. Yeah, thanks, Victoria. This is um, very, it sounds very similar, the sort of politicization of different types of migrants in the UK as to what you're describing there. And I mean, I really find myself often returning to, to James Tyner's writings and ideas of surplus populations and creations of deserving and less deserving populations. And it strikes me very much just, just now in Britain where we have these, this migration going on now. So migrants, coming across the channel, as I mentioned, to claim asylum in England, um, constructed as undeserving economic migrants who should not be allowed in. And in fact, legislation is going through to mean that they will not be able to claim asylum. The, the new borders bill proposed this year is suggesting in co contravention of the UN um, Convention on Refugees, that when they arrive on the borders of England, they will not be able to claim asylum. That's what the UK government is now proposing. So you've got this criminalization of this group of migrants at the same time as you've got this um, sort of idolizing almost of refugees who are coming from conflict situations in which it's deemed that the UK has some historical, contemporary, political and moral obligation. So I think there's a whole lot of complex histories and politics and hierarchies of migrant migrations and ethnicities wound up in this balance between who's deserving and not deserving, which translates directly into what kind of welfare provision is acceptable or, or not. Um, and 
I think in the UK, after a period of relative generosity, it, perhaps in the early 2000s, and we like there had a dispersal scheme that came in for forced migrants, we, we're now returning to a, a period of real quite stern border controls, both, both uh, strict hard borders and internal bordering processes. And I think it's, it's quite a worrying time in that respect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Hannah, your hand disappeared. I'm not sure if you, that was intentional. Um, yes, no, thank you so much. I've just realized John has a question and of course I work with Nisa so I can ask her a question another time. So um, I'll leave it to other people, but thank you. Okay, thank you. John? Very kind, Hannah. And thank you very much for the presentation, Dr. Finney. Um, one of the things that I've been looking at in terms of research here has been, um, in terms of uh, the housing markets in Canada, housing markets in general are becoming quite tense. So we've got property values going up everywhere. And it seems as though there's actually kind of a, a struggle in terms of not just for ethnic communities, but also for the white communities as well. And it almost seems like the immigrant populations are currently kind of serving as like a tension valve. The reason why the white people can't find houses is because of them immigrants. And I'm wondering if there is actually uh, a similar kind of housing polarization or a missing, missing middle class housing stock available in the UK, much like seems to be the case here in Canada, that might also be helping to fuel these kinds of disparities and feelings of uh, needing to discriminate and so on and so forth. Hmm. So yes, there is a, a missing middle, mid-range or middle-class housing stock. There are very steep house price inflation over the last year, particularly in rural areas accessible to cities as people move out, work from home, those who can move out. Um, it's hard to document exactly. This is another reason why I'm eagerly awaiting the, the, the census. But um, we do see that same that same tension in terms of housing market dynamics that you have people who are in precarious situations who are finding it very difficult to find affordable accommodation and also to get mortgages which is becoming uh, increasingly difficult I, I think and um, this lack of, of mid-range housing to buy um, partly because there's, there's not sufficient stock partly because the stock which is under private rental has increased substantially um, for various reasons. Housing, housing booms in the early 2000s have led to most of the private rental landlords in Britain being accidental landlords, one person, individual landlords. So there's all sorts of things in, in the, the dynamics of the housing market that do lead to this sort of hollow, hollowing out, like you say. In terms of the impact on attitudes to immigrants, I wouldn't say that that's a narrative that has been characteristic of the, the conversations recently, though historically it certainly certainly has. You know, we can't get jobs, we can't get houses because of, of the immigrants. Um, but actually, in the last couple of years, I wouldn't say, I mean, maybe Hannah has a different comment, but I wouldn't say that would be particularly characteristic. And I think that's perhaps because there's been such a, a push by the government to put over this discourse and narrative of successful control of immigration and leaving of immigrants, particularly EU immigrants, now that we've left the UK. So the, the narratives of control of immigration and emigration uh, are, are, so, are being pushed so much that it's somewhat quelling those um, earlier narratives of the immigrants are taking our houses and, and jobs. So it will be interesting to see in the long, longer term as Brexit sort of calms down and we hopefully move to a, a post-pandemic phase where international migration returns to, to a more stable situation, whether those kinds of, of narratives and explanations of welfare competition come back in. Great, Vicky, round two. Um, I noticed you didn't talk about religion at all, which mm -hmm. does become an issue. And um, at least in the Canadian census is asked every two censuses. And, you know, 
there are also issues of not wanting people who are of a particular religion to live near you, right? So I wondered, I mean, obviously it interacts with or it intersects with ethnicity, but, you know, Islamophobia is a huge issue. And I just wondered if you look at that at all. Yeah, not, not so much. But there's quite a lot of crossover, as you say, in the, the narratives and attitudes here, particularly with Bangladeshi, Pakistani ethnicities and Muslim religion. And there's been one way that's, that's manifested is debates about dress and people being exclude exclusionary or I mean the, the Home Secretary a few years ago made a comment that in his in his um MP surgeries he couldn't communicate with people if he couldn't see their see their faces which set off a, a great big row about about sort of prejudice towards religious dress. So it, it in it's definitely intersecting with the the attitudes towards um ethnic minorities and certainly in the in the period after the the 2001 terrorist attacks ideas of anti-segregation ideas and fear of clustering and ghettos was very much focused around fears of of terrorists and we don't want groups of these muslim people living together because of fear of terrorism and i think some of those those feelings do persist now um, though the Muslim Council of Britain has done a very good job over re recent years um, in terms of sort of like making the population, I guess, less prejudiced, more educated about Islam. Um, but there's also other religions where the, there are some feelings of hostility or certain negative, certainly negative stereotyping. So Jewish populations, for example, which have some very, very strong and historic concentrations in parts of uh, London and North Manchester uh, are often picked out as well as being potentially problematic because of the, the orthodox nature of, of their um, pra practices. Um, the EVEN survey was focusing on religion and religious groups as well as ethnicity, so there is a focus in that on certain questions, so it is something that I do hope to, hope to look at before too long. Yeah, just to give you an example, uh, the last round of refugees coming in, the Syrian refugees coming in um, to Canada, there were um, hotels in Toronto um, that were housing them. And one of the hotels was set fire to because there was a claim that there were a lot of Muslims and they slay and they kill, I don't know, goats. And, you know, they were doing these slaughtering in the, in the lobby of the hotel, which wasn't at all true. But, you know, people in the neighborhood didn't want them nearby. Um, mm. Just, yeah, an example. Okay, thank you. Martin. Hi, um, thanks for a great pres presentation. That was, that was really, really fascinating. I, I, one of the things I was thinking about, and I think this is something that we talk about in Canada sometimes as well, is to what extent the kinds of striking ethnic inequalities that you're talking about are a problem of the housing system and inequality in the housing system, which is when you were talking, I guess, about why these things are happening, you were mostly talking about uh, um, under-resourcing in the housing system and the individualization of responsibility in community settings and those sorts of things. But I guess I'm wondering, are these inequalities also as pronounced, say, in labor markets and in access to education um, and in other aspects of social life, in other words, in Britain? Like, is are inequalities more pronounced in the housing system? And therefore, is this a specific housing system problem? Or really, are we talking about just one manifestation of sort of ethno-racialized inequality in the whole social system? A lot of the social system shows similar differences and in general disadvantage for minorities and migrants. So it's persistent across social realms. Perhaps one exception where it's a little less clear is in education, um, where Actually, at, at school level, ethnic minorities 
do do better than majority children. Um, but this begins to fade as we go through into higher education, not in terms of enrollment in higher education, but um, completion of higher education and completion at what would be called high ranked universities. Um, and then by the time you get through, if you take thinking a sort of life course approach, by the time you get through then into employment, you, you start to see the disadvantages for ethnic minorities come in in the in the labour market. Um, segmentation by labour market sector and um, disadvantage in terms of part time full time contracts and, and so forth. So I think it is very interesting to take this life life course approach and I'd like to do a bit more of that sort of cohort cohort approach of at what point do we see the these inequalities really shifting into certain phases of, of life and I guess it's at that point when people enter the labour market that they start looking for housing and, and they maybe can't afford the kind of thing that they want or they could they can't move out of the the area they're in either because the housing is available they can't afford it or they don't want to and if they don't want to then they don't have an option of alternative forms of housing within that that local area um, so yeah, in general, it's not a not a great picture across the board. And if you're interested, Code produced actually this book. I've got it here: um, Ethnicity, Race, and Inequality in the UK. You can't see. It, I don't think it's the state of the nation, um, which is available free online to download from Policy Press as a PDF. And that summarizes thematically the state for ethnic minority groups across different social domains. Not a very cheery read. That's probably the best way to put it. Not very cheery, but nevertheless. Hannah, we uh, I know you've been very patient, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> check in with you and see if you'd like to answer, ask your question oh. next. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, thank you again, Lisa. That was, that's really, really interesting, the entire talk. My question was just around, um, from your experience, when you're working in these policy environments, where maybe not so much recently, as you said, but where uh, the role of racism is kind of disavowed and it's talked about as a post-racial state, how do you get policymakers to listen? Or do they listen? <laughs> I think that most people find it really hard to talk about race and racism. Mm. And we as a group here are somewhat practiced at that. But even within our schools, our de departments, where people are not engaging with, with these ideas, particularly my colleagues in, in geography, we have sort of geography departments that are physical and, and human geography. Even a language to talk about race and racism is, is not common. And I think that's the same with policy making. And that's, I suppose, Hannah, what I mean in my conclusions, where I think we need sort of new way, ways of, of seeing and expressing that are not fearful of talking about race and racism and are able to engage in the, the historical context that produced the, the contemporary situation. Um, I think that's been really difficult in the past and, and talking explicitly about race or racism, ethnicity has been avoided in favour of talking about community and mixing and diversity. Um, but I think, as I say, that may be slightly shifting given what's happened over the, the, the last year and the, the, the kinds of things I pointed to at the beginning. But Hannah, this is something we're going to have to deal with in the project. So if you've got any comments to add to what I've said, Hannah, on the points, particularly questions about coronavirus impact and, and such like, please do go ahead because you're doing the field work just now. Yeah, no, no, I have like, I think you summarised it um, incredibly well. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, no, it's just great to hear about the kind of policy impacts. I know in the, the UK, we have a lot of um, post-racial discourse. I know Scotland as well, for example, has the kind of, Racism isn't an issue here. We're, we're, we're new Scots. So, um, yeah, no, thank you, Nisa. That's fantastic. Okay, thank you. And I have uh, Cece Wong, and I hope I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Cece. Uh, yes, it's correct, Cece. So, thank you so much for the fantastic presentation, Dr. Finney. Um, 
I currently look at the home ownership uh, um, of immigrant in Canada. So one of the uh, things I have find for the uh, relatively lower home ownership rate among immigrant is that because the uh, location choice, immigrants tend to settle in cities uh, where the housing price is really high. For example, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. So I just wonder, is there like a similar situation in the UK where uh, like there are top um, immigrant uh, destinations where the housing situation is a little bit different than other cities? I suppose London would be the, the main comparator, but then even within London, it is so, so very varied street to street. And that map that I showed early on of where Grenfell Tower is, I mean, literally a block away, you've got multi-million pound mansions next to high rise, mid 20th century, poorly constructed tower blocks with overrepresentative of minorities and migrants. So I think it depends what kind of immigrants you're talking about and where they're going to go and then which parts of the cities they're going to go. Yes, um, like you've described, immigrants will at least initially locate in, in major urban centres, London, Manchester, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Birmingham. Um, but often will we'll disperse outwards as, as the general sort of pattern. Um, and, it, and it even even within city centres, there is there is some variation in housing price options, not necessarily in home ownership. Um, yeah, so I don't know about city centres rates of home ownership for immigrants compared to others. Um, but I would I'm not aware of this being the problem you describe of the being sort of priced out of housing markets in certain areas of certain cities being particularly different for immigrants compared to the rest of the population. I think in some ways the problem is perhaps a little bit in reverse. So if we, if we take some parts of central London, for example, around the city of London and Tower Hamlets, which is traditionally an area of, of Asian and for us Asian is sort of Indian subcontinent migration. Um, the, those particularly Bangladeshi populations have been displaced from there as this regeneration of those areas to, to service the, the finance sector economies in that, that central London location. Okay, thank you for that. I don't, I don't see any other hands, so I'd like to take the chance to ask my own question, if I may. Um, I was really floored by the uh, image you showed of the sort of mapping of exclusions uh, in various policy domains uh, and a sort of historical treatment of that. It, and it reminded me, I sort of hadn't thought about this for a long time, that um, the, the last time we had any kind of treatment like that at the federal level of of housing policy, at least in a kind of, in, in terms of the way your slide looked in a kind of very magisterial kind of broad sweep and overview, was a, a book that's, a, I guess, about 25 years old now by a John Bacher called Keeping to the Marketplace. So you can, you can tell what he found based on his review. Um, and, and I was sort of reflecting on a point that you made a little bit earlier in your presentation about this, uh, uh, this sort of the the privatization of housing markets and the movement away from housing as a, as a need or necessity and, and towards something that's sort of a, a commodity transacted in the marketplace. And I, I wonder if you could just sort of reflect broadly, it's not so much policy as it is, or maybe it's both, but it's, it's more a, a sort of a cultural reflection. It, are, we, are we irretrievably beyond the point where we can be collectivist about housing policy? Or I mean, is that moment gone? Uh, I'd have thought the UK would be in a better place given your sort of history of more uh, public housing provision than, than in the Canadian context. We always have a, an influence from across our southern border, border in terms of the treatment of housing as a, a commodity. But uh, is, that, is that moment past or can we get back to that? And how does that affect the kinds of groups you're interested in? I wouldn't say the moment's past. And I think that's because 
the remains and perhaps augmented by the situations people have faced during the pandemic lockdowns, a real sense of place, of community, of where I come from and of a rootedness that includes the house and the housing and the neighbours and the street and the community in which people live. So this is still part of most people's ambition in life to have a home and that's a strong driver whatever that vision of, of the home looks like and that is coming through to some extent this idea of home and community in the, in this leveling up agenda although not necessarily explicit not necessarily in, in the language that I'm using so I think that the recognition that, that place and community remains important to people and needs to be nurtured by government at all levels is, is there within the political discourses, if not near the surface, and if not explicitly, I think it's there such that it is, it is retrievable. Retrievable how is, is perhaps the, the question, and it's going to take a great deal to get any major investment in social housing. And this is the crux of the, the problem really. So all of the initiatives for semi-social housing lately have been through private partnerships and there are massive um, house building ambitions and targets that local authorities have to meet, but they're all being met through private, private um, negotiations where a proportion of it has to be so-called affordable housing which still remains very unaffordable for a great many people. So it's the how rather than the the will or the kind of desire to have this idea of home or the collective sense of importance of housing. Um, yeah I mean I, th I think it's I think I think the, the a sad thing over the last year has been that many people, including me, have been in a lovely situation where you've got a house and you've got a garden. And if you need to stay just in your house or just around your mile of your area, you can really enjoy it. Uh, you can go out to parks or whatever. And a great many people can't. And ethnic minorities that have been overrepresented within that group. So the experiences of home is, is so vastly different. And what seems to be happening is that, that this, this inequality has grown somewhat. So that, that somewhat anecdotally, but we have had media reports about people buying second homes in the country so that they can live live this sort of dream and they can work from home. And this does seem to be happening. So in the medium to longer term, um, sort of in relation to John's question, this is gonna really affect the housing market dynamics that those who can are buying multiple homes and those who can't, still can't get their, their one home. So th there is a real practical concern about how this will and desire for, for um, generating the, the right to a home to reality is actually gonna be possible. It does seem that that capital in those segments of society that have the opportunity to sp spend it and dream uh, find a way to park their capital in ways that obviously mostly most cannot. So, and uh, I'm just looking across the screen to see if there are any other questions. Gabrielle or Gabriel? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Professor Nisa, it was a very interesting talk, very fascinating. I was wondering if you came across any experience of local governments, um, uh, a successful experience or political uh, public uh, uh, policy where like mayors or groups, local groups, they, they could understand better the needs of these groups uh, that uh, are living these conditions, because um, in different kinds, like one of the problems like of housing policy from like in Brazil, the country that I know, it's when you try to uh, different policies when try to accommodate uh, people that live in, in uh, 
and these kinds of circumstances into a more um, uh, in, into a more equality, it brings another type of problem because you don't understand uh, policymakers sometimes don't understand that exactly their needs. So, did you came across any success or at least less uh, problematic uh, uh, local government policy in this case? Hmm. I don't think I'm knowledgeable enough about the difference between specific local housing policies as they relate to different ethnic groups to provide a, a comparison there, Gabriel. But one thing that, that did come out from our work with housing sector stakeholders was the efficacy, particularly in parts of East London around Newham, of coalitions of ethnic minority housing associations, particularly through what is called BME National, which is a group of ethnic minority housing associations, which, which are pretty much all in, in London and many in that area of North East London. And that seemed to be seems to be a very good example of not only the provision of housing that is affordable and appropriate for ethnic minority communities, but also a model for how housing providers can, through coalition, advocate for the needs of, of minorities. And um, that's waning a little bit, I think, as housing associations generally. Um, suffer from the kinds of contexts that I've been describing, the, the competitive nature of the, the social housing arena, the dominance of some very large housing associations and in, increasingly so. Um, but I think that that was one good example of a model that wasn't particularly a local government policy, but that was operating in particular local areas under the remit of, of local governments that I think could could well benefit other other places if they were able to get that initiative kind of initiative underway. Great, thank you. I'm just looking across the screen to see if there are any others with any burning questions. Good. Well, Professor Finney. It's been uh, an honor to have you with us. Thank you for your thought provoking presentation. I know it must be what? It must be coming up on 8.30 PM your time. You've given us plenty of time and plenty to think about. So I think it's probably high time now that we let you go. We really appreciate you responding in the affirmative to give this lecture. And uh, you've helped to bring our community together in a way that we hadn't before and thinking about housing specifically. So we really appreciate that. Thank you for your time and your lecture and we wish you all the best. And thanks to everyone for joining today. Yes, a round of applause across the screen. Thank you for that. Thank you all very much. I've immensely enjoyed it. And thanks for your thought provoking comments. And do remember us if you are ever in Scotland or would like to come. We will indeed. Thank you. Take care, all the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye for now.